Good evening. Leadership is love. Leadership is love. This is the medicine for human connection. It's a word spoken by my predecessor, great teacher, Bill Schonenheim, before he passed away some seven years ago. Every class at UC Berkeley in leadership, he ended with the words so the students could hear and walk away with that, leadership is love. Every one of us is a leader. Every single one of you is a leader. Leadership is a choice. Doesn't, it's not about having direct reports, it's not about being in a high-placed company. Acts of leadership are happening all the time. Four questions that the Navajo tradition asks when someone's not feeling well. The first one is, when in your life did you stop singing? When in your life did you stop dancing? When in your life did you stop telling stories? And when in your life did you stop feeling comfortable in the sweet territory of silence? They didn't give pills and shots and things. They wanted to understand how a person maybe fell out of sync, was no longer in sync with themselves, or in sync with the world. What did it mean to stop what does it mean to stop singing? When did you stop really living, really enjoying yourself, taking risks, doing new things? When in your life did you stop telling stories? When did you stop relating to people, connecting to people, a little too busy to connect to people? And when did people stop connecting to you? At UC Berkeley, I have a wonderful job. I'm the heart guy at the business school, and I get to teach the five powers of leadership of personal connection. The five powers are the power of presence, the power of communication, the power of conviction, the power of intention, and the power of knowledge. These five powers show up all the time. And these five powers lead us to creating new relationships and new possibilities with people surrounding us. A long time ago, when I was 25, it was November 19, 1977, I'm standing on the airfield at Ben Gurion Airport outside of Tel Aviv. It's a very, very special day. There's an Air Egypt jet circling around. It's there legally because a great thing is about to happen. It lands, and a tall, elegant man comes down the stairway. It's Anwar Sadat. He comes down the stairway into a sea of dignitaries. Prime Minister Menachem Begin is there, General Moshe Dayan, Yitzhak Rabin. But he doesn't stay very long there. He moves over to a middle-aged, grandmotherly woman on the right-hand side of the airfield. It's former Prime Minister Golda Meir, his former archenemy. He bows to her, extends his hand, and says, Madam, it is such a pleasure to see you. She takes his hand, moves it to the right. We're all wondering what's going to happen. And two steps forward, and she throws her arms around him and says, Mr. President, I welcome you to my land. I've been waiting my entire life for this moment. In that moment, you saw the five powers. Her presence, her presence was completely integrated with awareness self-confidence, and a lot of vulnerability. The communication, the conviction, the meeting of two old enemies suddenly became a new possibility. And it wasn't perfect then, and it's not perfect now, but somehow relations were established. Embassies happened some months after. And that moment of showing up and choosing to be present, choosing to be present, that's the choice all of us can make. You never know who's going to cross your path. You never know who's going to enter your world. It could be the grocery clerk, a post office person. It could be a teacher. It could be anyone. Are you open to human connection? You never know where that's going to lead you. I do a lot of work in corporations. I was working with a leader of a national security lab 
for years. He was a very, very nice man, Gary. And I liked him a lot, but he had a really bad reputation in the laboratory because he was very frugal and he wouldn't sign purchase orders. And ultimately, he paralyzed the workforce. They couldn't do their work. So I did a workforce study and I showed him the results. I said, Gary, at this moment, my friend, 78% of 7,000 people would give you a no-confidence vote. How does that feel? And he went into denial. Mark, you can't count very well. I'm sure you didn't count the uh, things and so forth. I said, you can take it and look at the data. What are you going to do about it? And finally, after some hours, he said, OK, I need to change the movie. How should I do it? I said, I'm your coach. I'm not going to tell you how to do it. How do you want to do it? He said, well, the problem is they don't know me. I said, OK, let them know you. He decided he wanted to share his leadership story, where he came from, what his story was. I said, brilliant idea. Three weeks from now, there's an emerging leaders conference. They're going to be beginning work in a leadership academy. And you can be the keynote speaker and kick the whole thing off. And he just about died of nervousness, but he did it anyway. So we're at this grand hotel in the Albuquerque area. And here's Gary, 68, shaking like a leaf, coming towards the audience, just like you, but 550 engineers and scientists. Right there, can you imagine the crowd? Engineers and scientists. <laughs> and he looked at me, and I gave him a nod, and he looked into their eyes, and he said, my father died when I was six. My father died when I was six. My mother, after her day job, had to go out, put on a maid's uniform, and clean the houses of the wealthy people in South Miami Beach. So my five brothers and myself would have food to eat on the weekends. My mother will be 96 next week. She remains my most beloved hero. I thought I was at a rock concert, the cheering, the high fives, the double five, people hugging me, I don't even know who they are. <laughs> Rushing towards the stage, hugging this man. Empathy absolutely like water through the aisles. The identification, because all of them didn't grow up with a silver spoon in their mouth, a lot of them grew up in very poor conditions. Suddenly there was a universal communication moment, there was a universal understanding, there was a universal human connection. We are one, and now we understand. And forgiveness was all around. The next day at the laboratory, you would have also thought it was a holiday. Transformation was everywhere. Positivity in the air. I said to Gary, I'm going to buy you lunch, pal. I'm so proud of you. See you at 12.30. I'm waiting 12.30, 12.40. What's happened now? Shows up at 1. I said, where the hell were you? I've been waiting for you for a half an hour. He said, oh, I'm really sorry, but I was signing purchase orders. <laughs> I said, wow. That was quick. He said, you know, last night was a huge wake-up call. A huge wake-up call, I feel like. A hundred pounds came off me. Thank you so much for the moment. And I said, no, the thanks is mine. Thank you. These are the possibilities of human connection. Our stories, our personal stories, we all have leadership stories. You have 80 stories, I have 160. There are stories everywhere. Everywhere. And we can often connect through our stories. In May of 1984, I went to see a production of Death of a Salesman, Dustin Hoffman in the main role. I was a theater director for years. I directed this play. I know every word. I love it. And I always go to plays by myself because my wife and family don't like to come because I comment on the plays that's going on. <laughs> they said, you know what? We'll meet you for a drink after. So I said, fine. I'll be the third row center, happy as a clam, Wednesday, Walter Kerr Theater. I'm right there where you're sitting. And of course, it's an American tragedy. It's Willie Loman, poor guy, my father's generation. Tries his best, tries his best, and doesn't have any work, and can't support his wife. And so he resorts finally to suicide, because at least the life insurance will kick in, and she'll have some security. So imagine the last scene with the widow Linda at the cemetery Theater just like this, looking at this wall, and she says to the audience, why did you do it, dear? 
why did you do it? We made the last payment on the house today and there's nobody home. Why did you do it? We're free at last. We're free. We're free. Suddenly I feel a hand on top of my hand. I think I'm imagining it. But I look and there's actually a hand covering my hand. I look over to my left. First of all, who's touching me in New York City? <laughs> you know? To my left. The elderly woman with snow white hair. Tears in her eyes. Beautiful blue eyes. And she just mouths the words very quietly. Do you mind? <laughs> Do you mind? And then, of course, the applause and standing ovation. Dustin Hoffman, my God, the audience is like out of their minds. And my seatmate says, I'm so sorry, sir. Excuse me, I have to go. I said, no, no, wait. Wait, I just want to talk to you for a moment. She said, I have to get my train. I said, I'll get your train. I promise. I'll get you home. We go to a little diner, crummy little diner in Times Square, sitting there having coffee. Betty Johnson, 85, lost her husband seven years ago. Tells me her story. She says, the kids never call. I'm so lonely. I'm so lonely, she said, but I'm feeling a little guilty. I said, what is it? She said, when Linda spoke those words, we made the last payment on the house today. I saw how lonely she was, and suddenly I didn't feel so badly because I realized I'm not the only lonely person. I said, oh, sweetheart, you are not the only lonely person. <laughs> I'm also lonely. My sister's lonely. A lot of us are lonely. And she just took my hand. She said, it's such an honor to spend an afternoon with another lonely human. <laughs> we met for several times after that. Coffee, theater, talking about life. The ups and downs of life. She became a very, very good, good friend of mine. Passed away a few years ago. So, finally, we see what happens when presence is at the table. There was so much presence in that little diner, the vulnerability, the caring. There was so much love in that diner. The crummy little table, love all around. Marianne Williamson put it very well in her best-selling book, A Return to Love, when she said, when we're liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liber liberates others. And when we let our own light shine, when we let our own light shine, we give others permission to do the same. Love is the only medicine you need for the journey of human connection. Love is the only medicine you need. It's actually what the world needs the most right this very moment. Every one of you is a leader. Every one of you has the love within you to actually create the new possibilities. All of this, all of Marianne Williamson's words, being liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others, those are little acts of leadership. Little acts of leadership. And they happen to also be little acts of love. Thank you. <laughs>